Well, good evening, everybody. Um, do grab your coffee and uh, find a seat. It's really good to welcome you here to St. Peter's this evening to the London Institute for Contemporary Christianity. If it happens to be your first time here, you're really welcome. Um, I'd also like to say hello to those who are joining us uh, through our live stream link this evening. It's really good that you're able to join us as well, and we'll make sure that you get opportunity to ask your questions along the way too. Uh, my name is Tracy Cottrell. I'm um, part of the team here, and I lead the development of our mission and activities here at LICC. I'm your host for this evening. And uh, amongst other things, that means I need to give you some important um, information. Um, as you'd imagine, we haven't planned a fire drill for this evening. So if we do happen to hear the alarm go off, uh, do make your way out of the building um, as quickly as you can, either through the doors that you came in through at the, at the back or through the side door here to my right. Um, our rendezvous is just to the left of the building down the road towards Oxford Street outside a restaurant called Marouche, and you will spot it because it has a flaming torch in front of it, so easy to remember. And if you're uh, not familiar with the building, we do, um, we, we ha our toilets are out either side of the reception area. The ladies are to my right and the gents uh, to my left. Well, there are a number of people here this evening um, who are here for the first time and probably not so familiar with who we are and what we do. And I do hope you get a chance to chat with people along the way uh, through the evening. You'll have discovered there are some materials on your chair which hopefully will help you to discover a little bit more about what we do. But if this evening does leave you curious about LICC, um, then I recommend uh, that you read um, the, I think somebody's gonna change the slides, thank you. I recommend that you read the first chapter of this book, Fruitfulness on the Front Line. Uh, the chapter is, is just slightly too long to skim read in the reception area. So you'll, <laughs> so, um, you'll have to buy the book and, um, and take it home and read it there. But I can assure you it's worth every penny. Uh, not only will it help you to see afresh your part in God's purposes in the world, but it will give you a framework to explore how to be fruitful for God wherever you do life, Monday through Sunday. And that really matters. For today in the UK, there are less than 6% of Christians who go to church on average, on an average Sunday. We are a minority, yet God is God. And he has us exactly where he needs us in our times. Monday through Saturday, here we are, scattered in all kinds of places, in our villages and our towns and our cities and our organizations, families, connecting to scores of people who are perhaps unconvinced of the good news of Jesus Christ. And yet through us might taste and see that God is good. Lockhart's first principle of forensics is this, every contact leaves a trace which is where an evening like this uh, fits in. For indeed, if we are the people of God out in the world on our daily front lines, then understanding the times in which we live and how we might respond as followers of Jesus really matters. And we're here this evening, uh, I imagine, for all kinds of reasons. Um, the issue of um, mental health um, probably touches all of us in different ways, it might touch us personally, in our families, in our churches, people that we know in the places that we work. But touch us also, as also probably as Christians concerned about the state of our nation. And I don't need to uh, say too much more about the state of our nation as far as our mental health is concerned. Our speaker will unpack something of that for us. But I do want to say how grateful I am to Dr. Nick Land for joining us this evening to help us navigate one of the most uh, 
challenging issues, really, of the times in which we live, and particularly to help us understand this through the lens of the Bible. Uh, Nick is a former um, medical director of uh, the Tees Esk and Weir Valley's NHS Foundation Trust. It's a large mental health and disability trust in the northeast um, uh, of England. And he led a, a team of over 160 consultant psychiatrists serving about 2 million people. He was uh, chair of Christian Medical Fellowship for three years. He's currently a member of the General Synod and speaks nationally and internationally on mental health within a biblical within a biblical worldview. He is, of course, a follower of Christ and a long-time practitioner in one of the most challenging areas of health care. Nick, we're delighted to have you with you uh, this evening, uh, for this evening. And in a few minutes, he's going to talk to us probably for about 45 minutes, 40, 45 minutes, and then we're going to have a very short comfort break. And after that, we're going to have a conversation with Nick, which is going to be guided, it's going to be shaped by the questions that you have and the questions that are coming from our live stream uh, audience as well. So I wonder, would you join me in welcoming Nick with us this evening? Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nick, before you uh, come and talk to us, I'm, I'm just going to ask uh, two or three questions, uh, really to help our audience understand who you are and... Uh, where you've been and what you've done. So the first one is fairly straightforward. Um, matters of um, mental health have been important all through your professional uh, life. Can you tell us a little bit about that working life and how that's been part of it? So I've been uh, a psychiatrist for 30 years. Uh, one of the things I often get asked is, what's the difference between a psychiatrist and a psychologist? To which the answer I usually give is 30,000 a year, <laughs> uh, which is funnier if you're a psychiatrist than if you're a psychologist. Um, and, but of course, it's very unfair for any psychologist in the audience. I just mm. want to know I feel your pain. Um, but psychiatrists are medical doctors. I did six years at medical school at, New at um, Cambridge and then Newcastle. I did seven years psychiatric training postgraduate. And then I've worked 24 years as a consultant psychiatrist. And for the last eight of those as medical director of a large uh, mental health uh, organization. And one of the things I noted um, I was always very involved with education, with training medical students. And one of the things I noted was that Christian medical students really struggled with their psychiatry uh, attachments. Um, they often got themselves into all kinds of trouble. Uh, they wanted to label everyone they saw who had hallucinations as being demon-possessed. That often went down badly with some of their senior medical colleagues. Um, and as a result of that, they were often very reluctant to go into psychiatry as a profession. And of course, that meant that psychiatry, where we really need to see Christians being involved, uh, was not having the Christians involved that we wanted to see. And therefore, um, I tried to develop some material just to help Christian medical students have a better understanding of what it means to look at uh, mental health within a biblical worldview and to try and bring the two to together. That's great, thank you. Now, you've been a uh, Christian for many decades now. Um, can you tell me, uh, or tell us all a little bit about your own journey of faith and how the issues of mental health have somehow been wrapped up into that? Mm. So, uh, like many, I uh, come from a Christian family. Um, I became uh, a Christian at a crusader camp, now Urban Saints. Um, but it really started to make a difference to me when I was 18. In June when I was 18, when I should have been taking my A-levels, I was involved in a severe road traffic accident. And I spent several months in hospital. And suddenly my life, all the things I planned, I had planned, all my expectations of university and everything was suddenly swept away as um, suddenly I had to spend all this time in hospital. And it made me realize that all the plans I had had were my plans and that they mm. weren't God plans, God's plans. And as I reflected, I felt that I really needed to make sure that in the future that they needed to be God's plans and, and not mine. So that was a significant learning experience. And the second thing that made a real difference to me was as a medical student going on electives, I then thought that I would, as a doctor, do infectious diseases uh, and go and work abroad in the mission field. But as a medical student, I went to an Indian Christian hospital, not to a mission hospital, but to a fantastic hospital run by a group of very dedicated Indian Christian doctors. 
And I talked to him about my plans, and he looked at me and they said, well, you're rubbish at languages, so that's going to be a problem. Um, but they then said to me, well, actually, your country is as pagan as India. India's our responsibility. You need to think about what you do and whether you should be in a speciality uh, where there aren't Christians, where it's going to be difficult. And you need to think about being in a part of the world or a part of the country where it's going to be difficult. And that really struck a chord. And so when I realized that, I did my psychiatry attachments and realized really just how, how few psychiatrists were Christians at that time, um, it made me think that this was an area where perhaps I should be getting uh, involved with. So those were two big influential factors for me. Thanks, Nick. And I don't want to preempt anything you're going to um, talk to us about shortly, but um, it'd be great to know what's your hope uh, for this evening as we share this time and space mm. together. We tend to, don't we, want to find divisions between things. And very often we divide ourselves between body and mind and spirit. Now, over the last probably 15, 20 years, uh, the health professions have begun to realize that dividing between physical and mental is increasingly not very helpful. And that actually there's a much bigger overlap than people um, think. And actually I would say the same relates between that, between physical, mental, and spiritual. Uh, and that actually one of the things I hope will come out of this I is an understanding that we are all whole people. We're made in the image of God. And there's a complex relationship between these things. And if we're going to nurture one another and support one another as we go through the difficulties that life will inevitably present us, then we need to have a deeper understanding of how all those things fit together within a biblical worldview. Thanks, Nick. Well, shall we come together um, in prayer, just committing our time and Nick um, to the Lord? Father God, we are so grateful um, that we get this particular space and this particular evening and the gift of Nick with us uh, to help us. And we pray for him as he shares his wisdom and insights. We pray for ourselves that we might be attentive to your presence with us. And whatever it is that has prompted each one of us to come here this evening, we ask our Heavenly Father that you might respond to the need that we might have not even articulated, but a need that we have to grow in wisdom for ourselves, for the people that we care for, for our churches and for our nation. So thank you, Father God, that you inhabit this space with us. You inhabit prayers of your people. And Father, we ask your blessing over Nick as he shares with us that he hears uh, us well, that he hears you well, and that we together might grow wiser in the ways of Jesus in our times. And we pray this in his name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Nick. That's great. Here we go. So it says there is retired medical director because I'm currently taking a career break and having uh, a year uh, studying uh, theology and training as a Church of England reader, which has been quite stimulating, if challenging. Now, thank you very much for coming uh, this evening and showing your wisdom uh, in being here because, of course, mental health is a really uh, significant issue. You'll see from the slide probably, and I would say, at least one in four people uh, in the population is going to have an episode of significant psychiatric illness at some point during their life. And the vast majority of us will have family members or close friends who have struggled with mental health problems. I look at my extended uh, family, it's quite a big extended family, but there's at least six members who've had significant mental health uh, episodes at some point uh, over the past decade. And um, probably 50% of all general practice consultations have a significant psychological um, component. And the World Health Organization has recently said that they see depression as the largest cause of morbidity right across the world. 
greater than infectious diseases, greater than all cancers. It's actually depression, uh, which is the thing that has the biggest negative impact uh, on the world's health. And I think as Christians, there are perhaps three major areas where we can contribute. I think the first of these is that we can show Christ's love to those who have mental health problems. We can treat them as whole people who Jesus loved enough to die for. Because whilst there is some improvement in terms of stigma, let us be quite clear, uh, stigma against people with mental health problems is still a major issue. And I have to say, in some ways, it can be worst in our National Health Service. It's certainly a real issue um, uh, in terms of uh, society, and it's an issue for people trying to get the help that they need. So we will show them Christ's love. Secondly, I believe our biblical knowledge of humanity and uh, humanity's condition before God gives us a special insight into some of the things that cause mental health problems and that we can bring a spiritual perspective that provides us with an extra dimension in terms of therapy for mental health problems. And finally, I think we have a responsibility to help our churches in their ministry to the mentally ill, both people in the church and those who are outside it. Because sadly, the stigma of mental illness is just as alive within churches many churches as it is outside. Indeed, um, it must be a real problem for people. Indeed, it, not s it is a real problem for people who've, say, got severe depression and who are told, well, it's their fault, they must have a deep-rooted sin or they must have a spirit of depression. It's an additional burden for them to bear. And unfortunately, the church generally falls into one of two opposite errors in terms of mental health and mental health services. One of them is open hostility and fear. I think partly this is because they equate um, psychiatry with Freudian psychoanalysis, and um, we've heard that's not a terribly good thing, uh, and therefore uh, advise people not to have any contact with mental health services. Um, there's certainly still Christian anti-psychiatry sites which say it's impossible, that being a Christian psychiatrist is an oxymoron. In other words, it's impossible to be a Christian and a psychiatrist. And of course, in those churches, people with severe mental health problems will be discouraged from getting the help they need, and that's very unhelpful. But also on the other end, there are a number of churches that uncritically take everything um, that's come through um, mental health services. And that's perhaps led to Christians with um, perhaps mild or moderate mental health problems who might well have benefited from biblical counseling and more informal help, ending up going straight uh, to secular uh, therapies when they might have been better served uh, within their church uh, environment. So what I'm hoping to do this evening is to answer three questions. The first is how do all the different um, secular medical models of how psychiatric disease is caused um, make sense within a Christian worldview? Secondly, are there psychiatric treatments or therapies which are consistent with Christianity, which we can be very happy to use? Are there some which are more challenging? And then finally, what is the contribution of sin and Satan to mental health problems? Um, I'm going to use generally uh, depression as my the thing I talk about, I clearly can't talk about the whole of mental health problems in the short period of time uh, that we have. And I've chosen depression because A, it's extremely common, and secondly, it also covers an a, a huge spectrum of severity. Many of us will have had episodes of our life where we've been mildly depressed, but depression can go all the way to being some of the most severe of mental illness and being life-threatening. And it also well illustrates the different models uh, of the etiology etiology, the causes of mental health problems. But before I get into the detail of that, I just want to challenge one preconception. There's quite a lot of people who think that the Bible never talks about mental illness at all, that it's all about demon possession. And I've just got a few verses um, that uh, just, I think, illustrate that there is, throughout the Old and New Testament, a model of mental health and an understanding. And the first one's 1 Samuel 21 13, if someone can read that for me. 
So he pretended to be insane in their presence. And while he was in their hands, he acted like a madman, making marks on the doors of the gate and letting saliva run down his beard. So I'm sure you all remember this story. Uh, David is being captured by King Akish, and he wants to escape. And what does he do? He pretends to be mad so that King Akish will let him, uh, will let him out. And in fact, the next verse says, King Akish says, don't I have enough madmen at my court? Send this one away. Not terribly politically correct, but this was a thousand years BC. Um, but the point was that both David and Akish had a model of mental health. Nobody was talking about demons here. They had a model of mental health problems a thousand years before Jesus was born. And the next one, Acts 26, 24. At this point, Festus interrupted Paul's defense. You're out of your mind, Paul, he shouted. Your great learning is driving you insane. So Paul is proclaiming the gospel to Festus. Festus doesn't want to listen, and he does what so many people do, is he tries to blot it out by suggesting that the claims of Jesus Christ are madness. But again, the point here is that there was a shared model there of what it meant to be mentally unwell. And the final one, uh, Rhoda, Acts 12, 13 to 15. Peter knocked at the outer entrance, and a servant named Rhoda came to answer the door. When she recognized Peter's voice, she was so overjoyed, she ran back without opening it and exclaimed, Peter is at the door. You're out of your mind, they told her. When she kept insisting that it was so, they said, it must be his angel. So this is a great story. Peter's been miraculously released from prison. He runs to his friends. Little servant girl looks through the door, absolutely delighted, rushes upstairs to tell people, doesn't let him in, which is perhaps unfortunate. Um, uh, and the word that they use of her when they're saying she's out of her mind is that she's manic, that she is delusionally optimistic, that it could possibly be Peter there. Although, of course, with God's grace, it was. And there are, of course, fantastic descriptions in Scripture of what it means to be depressed. Read Psalm 42, 43, 31, verses 9 to 12. Um, people in biblical times struggled with depression, just as many of us do. Now, if we're going to look at the issue of depression, I realize that while some of you may have quite significant either lived experience or professional experience of mental health problems, many of you may not have any at all. And this material very much is, um, originally much of it was developed for medical students, but many of them were quite junior uh, medical students. So I'm hoping uh, that as I go through this, um, this will be something that I you're able to um, find helpful as I just outline the five basic categories of um, different models uh, for the way mental health problems are started. And there's five of them, psychological, sociological, behavioral, existential, and biological. And psychological models of mental health, there are, there are numerous of them, far too numerous for me to describe, but I guess the very first one was that by Freud, classical psychoanalysis, developed classical psychoanalysis, uh, and he believed that there were two forces in people's life, uh, sex and power, or sex and death, and that um, when impulses reached the conscience that were unacceptable, um, they were turned inwards in a way that caused symptoms. So if I think I'm angry with my father, and that's an unacceptable thing to think, I turn that inwards and I become depressed. Another psychological model developed was by a chap called Bulby, who looked at young infants, babies, in the days where babies were admitted without their mothers, and he noticed that babies would cry and cry and protest. But then after a day or two of crying and protesting without their mother, they then became very withdrawn, that they'd lost, they'd broken those bounds of love. And he had a model of depression that related to them becoming much more susceptible to depression because of that. And it was one of the things that drove um, the process of admitting mother and child uh, to units when that was necessary. And then we have sociological um, models of mental health problems. Um, there was a, a couple of researchers in South London, Brown and Harris, and they noted that single mothers with three children, no jobs and no one to talk to, got depressed. I don't think you needed a big research grant. 
to work out that one. But, but, but the point was relationships and support are important to us all. And if you don't have that and you have a lot of responsibilities, uh, that's very difficult. There's a very interesting chap called Paykel um, who developed uh, some ideas around life events, excess life events that might happen to people. And he did some very careful research and he looked at all the things that might happen to a person. He ranked them in their likelihood of making somebody depressed. What do you think the very top one of that list was? Any ideas? Bereavement, right. But bereavement of whom? Losing who? Losing a child, and how old a child? Young child is there at two or three, but it's not the top one. It's interesting, it's actually a child on the edge of adulthood. Um, using uh, a child who's 17, 18, 19, 20 is extremely potent, uh, leading to people becoming depressed. But of course, there's lots of other things, loss of a spouse, uh, divorce, um, a whole range of different things that may cause depression. But very interesting, Pekel identified something else, that actually lots of life events together, even if they weren't negative life events, could make people more vulnerable to depression. And when I'm doing this lecture for medical students, I ask them to think of a time when they're going to be quite vulnerable. And uh, of course, it's when they graduate. They graduate from medical school. They often move city. They move church. They start a new job. Christian medical students are anything like in my year. They all get married on the same day between that. So the, the advice I give to them is get married the year before you graduate. Um, of course, you need to have somebody to marry. It's not just randomly getting married at that point. But, but try and spread those life events out. And quite seriously, think hard about whether you can make sure you go somewhere where you already have support. Because that number of life events um, can be quite challenging. You need to think about how you continue getting support. So that's sociological models, models of mental health. And then we get some behavioral models uh, of mental, of developing depression. There's a chap called Seligman who did some unkind experiments with dogs. These were not my experiments. I do not want to be blamed for this. But he took a dog and he put it on an electric grid and he turned the electricity on and the dog jumped off. Puts the dog on the electric grid, he ties the dog to the electric grid, turns the electricity on, the dog doesn't jump off. Then he unties the dog and he turns the electricity on and the dog still doesn't jump off. The dog has learnt that the dog is helpless and will no longer escape from pain. And you can see what models are arranged from that, that people who feel that they have no power over their environment that there's nothing they can do to, ex to escape from the negative consequences of the stuff that happens to them and where they are. They've got no chances, no life. That for those individuals, they may be much more susceptible to depression. Interesting, what Seligman then found was that if he lifted the dog off a couple of times, the dog could relearn that the dog could escape from pain. But probably the most important of the models, not just behavioral, but right across um, uh, uh, all of these is that by Aaron Beck, who developed the ideas that led to the development of cognitive therapy, which is probably the commonest of the psychological treatments, uh, is the commonest of psychological treatments for depression. And what Beck, ident what Beck identified or suggested was that people would have developed a distorted cognitive view of their environment, and as a result of that, of themselves and of their achievements. Now let me, um, let me give you an example of how that might look. Say I look at the back here, and I see that Mark Green has fallen asleep uh, during my talk. How might I interpret that? He doesn't like it, that I'm boring. And of course, if I'm boring, well, that's a problem, because a lot of my work as a doctor involves teaching. So if I'm a boring teacher, I must mean also a bad doctor. And of course, to earn money to feed my family, I have to be a good doctor. So if I'm a, a bad doctor, that means I must be a bad husband and a bad father. Do you see what I mean? I've looked at one thing, I've, making, I've taken the wrong conclusion about it, and I've then built a whole pyramid of negative um, things on top of that. We call negative automatic thoughts. Of course, the reason Mark's asleep is because he was up all night praying for this meeting in the way he does whenever uh, London Institute have uh, an evening uh, meeting. I'm sure that's the explanation for his soporific look. Um, uh, existential models of mental health. A chap called Frankel was, Frankel was a Jewish concentration camp survivor. 
And what he noticed in the camps was that some people just gave up and died, whilst many other people um, actually were able to survive. But the ones who survived were the ones who had faith in something, something that kept them going. It might be a faith in God. Sometimes it was a commitment to music. Sometimes it was a relationship that they desperately had to get to. But it was something that gave them meaning. And from him, he developed uh, a, a, a series of therapies based on the importance of the sense of meaning of existence. And Carl Jung, who's one of the other great psychotherapists, said that after the age of 35, uh, our main problem is the search for what does our life mean. And quite a few people talking about current techno youth culture have said it's increasingly a mixture of mindless optimism and despair. And my own experience uh, with students has been um, that particularly for art students, they come having bright-eyed, bushy-tailed to university. They've done their English and history A-levels. They've learned all the facts. They've learned what it means. And they come to postmodern departments who say there is no truth. You can know nothing. And it's very disorientating to suddenly be in a society where you can not have any firm foundations uh, for your knowledge. So existential causes of mental health problems. And finally, of course, we have the biological causes. This is the only one that matters. It's all around an impairment of biogenic monoamine function. And as long as we give people the right pills and adjust the chemical balance, everything will be all right. Now, I don't believe that. I didn't, if you're just worried, I believe that. But nevertheless, there is an issue that that's another school that it is around the fact that um, there is considerable evidence that in people with depression, there is a disturbance of the brain chemicals. But of course, whether that's a primary disturbance or whether it's secondary to the other things that have happened uh, is, of course, uh, a mute point. So what do we make of all these huge different models uh, for depression? Well, where a psychological or psychiatric theory is based on careful observation, I think we can learn a lot from it. But we need to be careful about the underlying philosophies of some of these theories before we take them on board the therapies that are associated with them. And we'll come back to that in a moment. Uh, but what I want to do now is just shift gear a little and talk about what the a model for the spiritual um, reasons uh, for mental health difficulties. And what I want to suggest to you is that when we look at Genesis 1 to 3, we can see that humanity is created with a need for five fundamental sets of relationships. Genesis 1.27 tells us, so God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. We are created in God's image as spiritual beings. We have spiritual needs, a need to be loved by God and to love God. And of course, initially, these were met directly through a face-to-face -face relationship where Adam and Eve could walk in the garden with God. The second thing we find uh, from the early chapters of Genesis is that we're created with um, social needs. God says in 2.18, the Lord God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I'll make a helper suitable for him. Now, as I'm sure you know, that word helper is usually used to refer to God helping man. It does not in itself contain any sense of um, subversience uh, or, or inferiority. But it, what the message it does give is that God had designed men and women to provide one another's social needs and as originally created to do that in a perfect way. The third thing that, ma that God creates man to do is to have a need for occupation. And there's quite a few verses that uh, talk about this, um, but if we just look at uh, Genesis uh, 128, God blessed them and said, be fruitful and increase in number, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Lord God took the man, put him in the garden, to be a steward, to look after uh, creation. And work at that time was creative, it was adaptive. Man was in effective control of his environment in partnership with God. 
And God also created man to be in harmony with nature. The next verse says, God says, I'll give you every seed-bearing plant on the face of the whole earth and every tree that has fruit with seed in it, and they'll be yours for food. There was a harmony with nature. There was no illness. There was no death. And the fifth relationship was for humanity to have, or for an individual human, to have a harmonious relationship with themselves. Curious little verse you may never have thought about uh, why it's there. Uh, God, in his wisdom, put it there just for my seminar, and I'm very grateful to him. Um, Genesis 2.25, Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Um, embarrassment is what happens when you do something and you feel a bit anxious because of what you've done, because you think everyone's going to um, think you're a bit of a jerk. But shame is when you feel that just about who you are, about yourself intrinsically. Not about what you do, it's just about who you are. And when originally created, man and woman were naked before each other. They didn't worry about their cellulite, whether their bum looked big in this or not. What they were perfectly comfortable with one another, and most importantly, they were comfortable with themselves. There was no anxiety, there was no shame. So that was great. A perfect uh, relationship with God, with nature, with one another, with work, and with the self. But of course, what do we then have? We then have the fall. And we see the severing of each of these. The first one in Genesis 3.8, then the man and his wife heard the sound of the Lord God as he was walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And they hid from the Lord God among the trees of the garden. So no longer were they going to walk face to face. That relationship had been divided and man was hiding. And when God challenges man about this and says, um, have you eaten the tree which I told you not to eat from? What does man say in 3.12? Oh, it was the woman who you put here with me um, who told me to eat. So immediately there is a division, a social division, with man blaming woman for all that went wrong um, and also blaming God. So a disruption of social relationships. And we see that work too becomes a burden. 3.17, God says to Adam, because you listened to your wife and ate the fruit about which I commanded you, you mustn't eat it. Cursed is the ground because of you. Through painful toil, you will eat food from it all the days of your life. And we read, too, of a destruction of the harmony with nature. The following verse says, it will produce thorns and thistles for you, and you'll eat the plants of the field. So work that was previously creative and positive now becomes one that's by the sweat of your brow, that's around thistles, that's around pain, that's around frustration. And of course, we can think about that in our own society, those who've got not enough work to do, those who have too much work to do. But this destruction of the harmony with nature uh, continues. By the sweat of your brow, you'll eat your food until you return to the ground, since from it you were taken, for dust you are, and to dust you will return. Death and illness have entered the garden. And finally, separation from self. The partner verse of Genesis 2.25 is in Genesis 3.10. When God says to the man, where are you? Man answers, I heard you in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. Shame and anxiety and an unhappiness with ourself is now part of the human makeup. So the choice to disobey God wrought a destruction that permeated every area of humanity. Their genes, their personalities, their relationships, their work, and guilt and shame and oppression and inner turmoil and conflicts arose. So what I guess I'm trying to say is that within this overall biblical framework, we can see how the various secular theories about mental illness psychological, biological, social, behavioral, existential, can all fit in looking at part of the truth of how the fall has sown the seeds for mental health problems.
We've got the separation from nature, which we can map onto the biological causes of mental illness. Genetic predisposition to mental health problems. Genetic causes of mental health problems, such as Huntington's career. Biochemical abnormalities predisposing to depression. Degenerative disorders, such as Alzheimer's disease. We can see the existential problem, separation from God. God gives us meaning, and without him, we are always going to be vulnerable. And we see very much the effect of idolatry, because, of course, what do people do? They find other things to put in God's place. Uh, within the medical profession, very often it is people's work. As doctors, we, we see our... and. It's not a reason. Uh, you know, it's great that we have a high view of what our work is. I think it is right for all of us to have a high view of work. But if we put work where God should be, then we know that work will let us down. And what I noticed in many of my colleagues over the past five years, where the NHS has come under considerable problems, it has led to many health professionals um, finding life much more stressful, much more anxiety-provoking, uh, and many more colleagues having mental health problems. We have to be very careful. If we put something in where God should be, it will always let us down. Separation from others. That may be bereavement that may predispose us. Sometimes it's early pain. Sometimes it's um, relationship conflict. As a young psychiatrist in casualty, time and time again, the people who came in who'd taken overdoses, it was because of their, they split up with their boyfriend or with their girlfriend. So often... Um, divorce, adultery, all of these things um, can cause a severing of relationship from one another and make us much more vulnerable. And separation from ourselves, leading to anxiety, shame, and inner conflict, is what's talked about by many of the psychotherapists and many of the schools of psychotherapy. And relationship from work, or rather separation from work, means that whilst previously Work would have been creative and adaptive. Now, for many of us, we find that instead of us controlling our environment, our environment controls us. And our mood and our emotions are pushed around by what's going on in our paid work, by our family life, uh, in our society. I only have to say the word Brexit and emotions of varying sorts um, uh, will, will, will appear in... Uh, in people. And it's very interesting that, isn't it? How our environment and what's going on has such a profound effect on us. So thus all these various secular therapies can be understood, I believe, as um, attempting to repair to some degree the damage done to relationships, the fundamental relationships that humanity should have by the fall. And many of these therapists have a very useful part to play. They have good research basis. And used carefully and wisely, they can make a very useful contribution uh, to helping with mental health problems. But of course, as Christians, we'll see a broader picture as well. And we can't ignore man's overwhelming need uh, for a cure for the disease of sin and a restoration of a right relationship with God that can only be done through Jesus Christ. So where a particular therapy um, has an underlying philosophy which really undermines the gospel, we may need to be very careful um, in the way we use it. If it's an area that particularly interests you, you'll see there's some um, as a reference links to a couple of articles I've written uh, for CMF, and one of those actually goes through a range of different therapies and, and gives you what the underlying philosophies may be and what the pros and cons are from a, a Christian point of view, because we don't have time to go through that in great detail today, but that is available for those of you who are interested. Well, it's available for those of you who aren't interested, but... Um, so let's change gear again and try and answer the question that I get asked a lot, which is what is the role of sin and Satan in causing mental health problems? And the first thing I say when I ask this is to challenge the prejudice that's involved with this question. Because people very seldom say, what's the role of sin and Satan in causing physical illness? But actually, anything I say to do with mental illness, you could say exactly the same about physical illness. And um, what I've been, I guess, is there's four levels in which 
There is a relationship between sin and Satan and mental illness. And the first one is the one I've been talking about. It's the generality of the fall. It's not the individual's fault that they have it. It is part of living in a fallen world. And Jesus makes this clear, doesn't he? When the disciples ask um, uh, for the man born blind, uh, is it this man's sin or is it his parents' sin that made him to blind? Jesus says, don't be silly. It's, not, it's neither of those things. But of course, there are other times where Jesus does suggest that sin can contribute to mental health problems. So as I would uh, say that the majority of physical and mental health problems are not down to an individual's sin, there clearly are quite a significant group of physical and mental health problems which we can track down to at least in part to sinful behavior. And I wonder if people can think of one or two things that might contribute both to physical illness and to mental health problems that are sinful behaviors. Any ideas? Okay, alcohol. That's a good one. Alcohol um, does bad things to your liver. And uh, if you drink a lot of it, uh, it rots your brain, can bring on early kinds of dementia, um, as well as contributing to a range of behaviors uh, that can contribute to further physical illness and mental health difficulties. So alcohol, what else? Okay, sexually transmitted diseases. At the turn of the last century, the most common cause for being in a psychiatric hospital was syphilis, quaternary syphilis. Of course, that might not have been the individual's sin. Quite often, it may have been the sin of their more likely husband in this situation. Um, when I was uh, uh, a young doctor, I stood for Newcastle City Council, and when I was out canvassing, I spoke to a very elderly man, he was in his mid-80s, and he had worked at the local psychiatric hospital. And when he was a young man, it had been his job to come down to the London School of Tropical Hygiene and get the infected mosquitoes that they used to treat quaternary syphilis. Um, they gave people malaria deliberately, there was lots of um, fevers caused, and it killed the bug, and it stopped the progression of the disease. Um, it did leave the people with malaria, um, Everything has side effects. Um, uh, we don't use that anymore, just in case anyone's worried about that. Um, but it's certainly the case that, um, uh, that high levels of promiscuous behavior can cause physical problems through sexually transmitted diseases, and is also likely to make people um, have, have less secure um, relationships, less secure attachments, and can make them, or indeed their children, more vulnerable to mental health problems. So I've just got a few other suggestions um, here. Um, speeding, that's not one you thought about. Um, I want to make sure it's something that most of us do rather than thinking this is something that other people do. Um, but speeding can cause both broken legs and that PTSD stands for post-traumatic um, stress uh, disorder. Sexual abuse. Uh, during my career, I've run a number of secure psychiatric units for people who've committed serious offenses and have mental health problems. One of those was for women. And when we did a survey, we found that every single one of those women who were in that unit had been badly sexually abused as a child. This was sin that had led to their problems, but it wasn't their sin. It was the sin of others uh, against them. And um, there are plenty uh, of examples, but I think one interesting one uh, might be Nebuchadnezzar as a biblical example. Uh, Daniel 4, I think it is, but Nebuchadnezzar looks over all his realm and he says, wow, aren't I cool? I've created all this. And God says, no. And Nebuchadnezzar has a psychotic episode, I think, is what it describes, and he starts living in the fields with the animals and his hair and his nails grow until he repents and then he's restored uh, to his previous position. So we've got the fall as the majority, so not anybody's fault, but the generality. We've got some issues which are around specific sins. And um, then we have uh, direct demonic temptation and attack will be the next level. I'm suggesting this is a pyramid and they're getting smaller each time. But can anyone think of a biblical character who demonstrates the way that demonic attack causes depression? Um, yep, Saul's a good one, not the one I'm looking for, but you get a point. Um, any others? Um, 
no, that's a, that's another one. I see that's more about possession rather than demonic attack, um, Legion. And Job is the one I'm thinking of. Um, Job becomes profoundly depressed. And of course, my friend Paykel, who I told you about adverse life events, how many adverse life events does Job have? You know, he loses his wealth. He loses his children. He loses all he possesses. He loses his many of his friends. And uh, he loses his, his uh, physical health as well. All of those things. And when you read the description, it's of a man who has become profoundly depressed. Because let no one doubt the reality of an intelligent and malevolent devil. Ephesians 6, 12 says, We contend not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers and authorities uh, and powers of this dark world and the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. And Peter 5, 8 says, Be self-controlled and alert. Your enemy, the devil, is prowling around like a roaring lion, looking for someone to devour. Um, I was having a discussion the other day with people and thinking whether we've made life much easier uh, for Satan on the grounds that he's probably more computer literate than I am. And the number of temptations that come to us through our web browsers and the algorithms that as soon as you click on something which is even the slightest bit salacious or the slightest bit inappropriate, you are then flooded with huge amounts of temptation. Um, I'm not sure whether algorithms in themselves can be satanic, but I do wonder whether this is a, an issue we're going to have to think more about as people, are the particular context I was thinking about this was people being tempted to gamble and people with gambling addictions and the way they are targeted with temptation, particularly children to gamble. And as soon as they show any interest, they're overwhelmingly um, given lots of opportunities. It's just a thought. I haven't developed that idea, but it's just something I've been thinking about. Um, but we have to be careful. When I eat the fourth bar of chocolate from the multi-pack, that is not a demonic attack. <laughs> that is my personal greed. And um, we can remember, uh, I think it's, it's Galatians, uh, when they talk about, um, uh, talk about uh, Gala um, I think it's the Galatians in Acts, where people had been involved with witchcraft and all kinds of things. And they needed to come and repent. It wasn't a suggestion there that uh, it was a demonic influence. They needed to repent. And we need to be quite careful that we don't blame uh, Satan for what is frankly just our own sinful desires. Well, what about demonic oppression and possession? The fall, our own sinful desires, demonic attack, possession and oppression. Well, I like this quote from C.S. Lewis because I think it's very helpful. Uh, there are two equal and opposite errors into which our race can fall about devils. One is to disbelieve their existence, and the other is to believe and feel an excessive and unhealthy interest in them. They themselves are equally pleased by both sets of errors. And our current culture is one that extraordinarily combines a scientific denial of the supernatural with an obsessional interest in anything supernatural as long as it's not orthodox Christianity. Um, this came home to me. I went to a wedding in Boulder, Colorado, the way that you do. And I'd forgotten to take my Bible. It was, it was just before the days where everyone had a Bible on their smartphone. And so I went to buy one from the local bookshop. It was a huge bookshop. There was a vast room, probably not much smaller than this, for religion. It was just vast. But as I went round, I saw there were four bays for Islam. There were four bays for Buddhism. There were five bays for um, first people uh, religions and shamanism. There was one row for Christianity. And as I went and approached it, I realized it was full of all these really orthodox Christian books, like how Jesus married Mary Magdalene and went and lived in France. Um, just so we're clear, that I don't think it's London Institute Contemporary uh, Christianity official policy that that's orthodox. Um, but, but there wasn't a single orthodox Christian book in this entire huge bookshop. There wasn't a Bible. There was nothing. There was vast amounts of interest in the spiritual and the occult. I could get something in anything else, but nothing about that. And that, I think, is the world we're in. We've got that interesting contrast between a, a scientific denial in the supernatural and an obsessive interest in anything, as long as it's not wholesome and Christian. And I think... Um, the New Testament dis distinguish between natural, supernatural causes uh, of disease. Um, Matthew 4.24 says, News about Jesus spread all over Syria, and people brought him all who were ill with various diseases, those suffering severe pain, the demon-possessed, those having seizures, 
the paralyzed, and he healed them. So a range of different categories, both natural and supernatural. And when you do an analysis, uh, you can find that 20 times Jesus heals, sometimes Jesus forgives, and sometimes Jesus casts out demons. And perhaps, I'm not sure about this, but perhaps that maps onto those are the disorders that Jesus found that had a natural etiology, those where it was a specific sinful etiology in terms of the individual, and those where there was a significant uh, demonic element. I'm going to stop talking just in a couple of minutes. Um, we may return to this in uh, questions, but I, I've got a few more things to say, but I'll try and wa weave them into responses to questions because I know people like to have a chance to talk about it, and it's important that we discuss the things that people are interested in. But this was just a final slide just to, because this is something I do quite, people really just disturb people, are voices demonic? And this is just my five bits of um, evidence where I would say generally people hearing auditory hallucinations is not demonic. The first one is um, hypnagogic and hypnopompic hallucinations. Now, for those of you who don't know what those f terms mean, they mean things you hear as you fall asleep and as you wake up. And 25% of us, including myself, will he hear voices and sounds as we fall asleep and as we wake up. Um, it does not have a pathological uh, or a pathospiritual uh, connotation. Hallucinations in acute confusional states, those of you who've worked with children or older people will know that when children, particularly young children, get an infection, or when older people get an infection, they have hallucinations. They don't need exorcism, they don't need antipsychotics either, they need antibiotics to clear up the infection, uh, or perhaps paracetamol to bring their, their um, uh, temperature down if it's a viral rather than a bacterial infection. Drug-induced hallucinations, we know we give people amphetamines, they will immediately have hallucinations. There's a direct effect here. And increasingly, when we do functional scanning, when people are experiencing hallucinations, we can see the bits of the brain that light up, because a hallucination is generally something that's going on in the brain that the person does not recognize that they are producing it themselves. And the final thing is response to treatment. Unless you uh, believe that antipsychotics stun demons, uh, it seems unlikely that response to treatment uh, means that, uh, uh, that voices uh, or typical paranoid schizophrenia uh, uh, is in any way related uh, uh, to the demonic. So I'm going to stop there. We're going to have a brief break, which I think Tracy is going to uh, say a little bit more about and gather some questions. Thank you so much. Thank you.